Good morning, everyone. We'll wait for another uh, couple of minutes before we start. So welcome. We wait for another minute or two, Jacob. Do you have a minute? Oh, or should, okay. Uh, I see. Or do you Sarah, want me to start? Sarah is muted. Oh, is that on purpose? Uh, no. Uh, she yeah, and she also got called to the Linux, so I think she just went there. But I can like uh, I can introduce. Okay. Yeah, I okay. think I think we should start. Okay. Perfect. I think we should start. Yes. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another webinar talk by. The medical physics for world benefit uh, and uh, this is uh, a, a special uh, webinar for me because a uh, speaker is Navneet uh, Hariharan. Uh, him and I we started pretty much our careers together so uh, I've known him for a long time and so proud of whatever he has achieved uh, in this career. He's a good friend, a mentor, everything for me uh, and so today's talk will be let me exit out of this presentation mode. Yeah, so today's talk will actually be on uh, risk-based quality management, uh, an overview of AAPM TG100, uh, a very important topic uh, within AAPM. Um, the moderators are uh, Sarah Ashmark, uh, another good friend, and uh, myself. A few rules before we begin the webinar. Um, you know, it's going to be about 45, 50 minutes, and then we'll have a, a short time for a Q&A. Um, we will also, if we run out of time, we will collect your questions and uh, email Navneet, and he can then uh, respond to the answers, which we will email all the attendees. Uh, there will be a multiple choice question that we will send out to everyone in case you need it for um, attendance uh, purposes. And uh, this webinar will be recorded and uh, posted online and shared within the community on our uh, YouTube page. Uh, a little bit on uh, Navneet uh, Hariharan. He's a seasoned clinical physicist uh, with over a decade uh, experience in the field. He has made a significant contribution to the medical community as an active AAPM volunteer and a member of the working group on implementation of TG100. He also serves as an ACR uh, ROPA surveyor and volunteer at the ABR. Prior to his career in healthcare, Navneet earned a degree in industrial engineering, bringing a unique perspective to his work as a medical physicist. Currently, he works at Beth Israel uh, Deaconess Medical Center, a Harvard Medical School teaching hospital in Boston. His passion lies in improving patient safety and refining clinical processes through innovative projects. Um, again, uh, if you have any questions, please do write in the chat and we will address them uh, at the end of the session. And 
thank you for everyone uh, attending uh, from all around the world. Um, of course, our president, uh, board members of MPWB, and a uh, special thank you to Navneet. I will stop sharing my screen and then uh, Navneet, you can share and you can make sure you have your audio shared on too. Thank you, Arjun. Thank you, sort of warm welcome. And uh, let's share my screen out here. Are you all able to see the presentation? Yes. Uh, welcome um, uh, to everyone uh, attending this webinar. Um, uh, and um, I'm a full time clinical medical physicist. Uh, here in the Boston area, I currently cover the Winchester Clinic uh, for Bethes Rail Deaconess. Uh, and as Ajit mentioned, I'm an active volunteer in AAPM, and I have been a member of the WG100 group uh, for many years now. Uh, we work on implementation of the TG100 uh, methodologies and building on the phenomenal work that the TAS group did uh, on risk-based uh, quality management. And I'm glad to see that so many of you are uh, interested in the topic. So uh, the purpose of today's talk is to uh, explain the value of risk analysis methodologies for quality uh, management and a, a brief review of the AAPM TG100 recommendations in this regard. It would be helpful to get some uh, context. Uh, so the, there are uh, multiple guidelines uh, that have been published and uh, we will summarize uh, those and provide the motivation for the TG100 work will give a high level uh, introduction uh, to the TG100 methodology. And we'll, uh, I also have some resources that uh, towards the end of the talk that will help you implement this in your uh, clinic. And uh, out of these uh, multiple publications, there are several recommendations, about a hundred or so uh, recommendations, and that would be an undercount. And these are from multiple uh, different uh, agencies. So some are international and, and some are domestic. Uh, th these include the WHO, IAEA, ICRP, uh, the British uh, NHS, and uh, the Safety is No Accident is a multi-society uh, multi report with uh, ASTRO in the lead and uh, 10 other organizations as part of it. And if you were to take uh, these 100 plus recommendations from these multiple guidelines documents, they roughly fall into about a dozen uh, or so threads. And if you were to further divide them into three buckets, uh, they would fall into something like this, uh, training competency and uh, standard operating procedure, uh, quality control, which is something we are all quite familiar with uh, in the radiation oncology community as part of doing machine QA and QCs, uh, and uh, robust safety culture. And this is what this talk would be uh, focusing a, a lot on. And this include things like uh, good communication, uh, safety checklist, hard stops, uh, using uh, incident learning system, a prospective risk analysis, which is the TG100 methodology, and uh, how to minimize interruptions and ambiguity. So motivations for this new approach. So we've been using a prescriptive way of quality control for such a long time. So why, why go with a new um, uh, approach? Uh, so we recognize that uh, all clinical processes are not the same. And uh, uh, some recommendations, even there are, even though there are 100 plus recommendations, uh, they don't directly apply uh, to uh, your clinic. And uh, data from national incident learning systems uh, support this. So, uh, and they say that the process has a more significant effect uh, than the equipment performance in a clinic. And since each, uh, and with the rapid increase in technology in the recent years, uh, and uh, and the fact that most of the standard practice, uh, most of the uh, uh, countries' practices are not standardized, uh, you see that there's a unique mix of uh, uh, equipment mix as well as clinical scope that is across the country. So there there is no one good way to give a prescriptive approach. And so uh, this new framework using TG100 will facilitate a structured evaluation of the clinic's processes uh, in terms of risk. Now here is uh, a, a case, uh, an unfortunate uh, severe radio surgery incident. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, the clinic had uh, 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 had an SRS cone-based program where the the cone is attached to a tray uh, for treatment. And for this to be uh, to happen correctly, the collimated jaw size would have to be set to uh, 50 millimeter by 50 millimeter. 
uh, and uh, to avoid any dose spillage. Uh, however, uh, this system was commissioned correctly, it was treated uh, for a while, but the initial physicist who had done this had left uh, the job and there was a new uh, person who came in was, who wasn't quite familiar with the SRS uh, cone-based approach. And at the same time, uh, they had a TPS and an r &B, uh, upgrade in the clinic. Uh, and what happened was the default jaw size was set to 98 millimeters. Uh, and as you can imagine, when they treated an SRS uh, uh, patient for a trigeminal neuralgia, uh, with a 90 gray uh, target dose, there was over 50% of dose that spilt, uh, that had uh, spilt over and affected the brainstem. And one patient was uh, uh, in a vegetative state and there were many other injuries. And now you may ask, uh, would equipment QA have prevented this? Maybe, maybe not. Um, you may do uh, light field versus right field on a monthly basis. You check your jaw versus your digital readout. However, that may uh, not have prevented this error. However, uh, if you had uh, set up a system where everybody in the group uh, uh, understands the process, and if you have a safety checklist, it may have prevented this. And this error exemplifies uh, the proper understanding of a clinical process in the staff involved that would provide a better safety than a, pr a prescriptive approach. So, uh, and when TT100, uh, they analyzed the IMRT treatment process, they found out that about only 9% uh, of the errors were due to hardware and software. And uh, the non-process errors were roughly about 25%, which left the other 75% of the possible error uh, pathways due to process. Uh, and uh, we've gotten really good at uh, prescriptive device-centric QA over the years. Uh, and but, but you see why a new prospective risk-based analysis would help you uh, make sure that the other 75% of the po possible errors are covered. Now, before we go any further, I think we should define what is risk. It's been mentioned many times during this talk already. Uh, so risk is the likelihood that a hazard uh, will cause harm. Uh, and a hazard is anything that can cause harm. And uh, if you think about it, all our um, uh, the, all the processes that we do in the clinic, there is a lot of hazard. And as professionals, it is our job to make sure uh, and prevent these hazards from reaching the patient. So uh, how would you describe risk? Uh, this one, I'm just going to read through this. Uh, you can answer these four questions, uh, and this would help you define risk. So what could go wrong? How likely is it to go wrong? And if it goes wrong, uh, how likely is it to be noticed? And what are the consequences if, if it were to go wrong? So once you answer these questions, now you can, defy, you can get, get your an idea of risk. So how do you analyze uh, this risk? So risk analysis is a process of analyzing these hazards in the process. And there are multiple tools that are used in the industry uh, and out of which TG100 picked uh, three tools. And uh, those tools are process mapping, uh, failure modes and FX analysis, and fault tree analysis. And when these tools are used in sequence, uh, they provide you uh, a way to establish a risk-based quality management program. The reason that TG100 picked these three tools versus all the other tools that are available uh, is because of the simplicity of how, how uh, they are used and the broad adoption in the community. So there's already a lot of data as to how it can be used. Uh, here's one another way of uh, looking at it. So the, uh, uh, un to understand uh, your process, you want to use process mapping. To assess the hazards and rank your uh, risks in, in order of magnitude, you want to use uh, failure modes and effects analysis. And to establish the failure propagation, then you use fault tree analysis. And then you put this in sequence and you establish uh, quality control or quality assurance uh, uh, methodologies that would give you a quality management program. So now uh, let's take a closer look at the first tool, uh, process mapping. So what is a, a process map? A process map is a, a, a set of steps that are arranged in order, and it describes the way in which things get done in your facility. It displays the flow of information, and it can be uh, uh, regarded as a visual representation of your SOP. Um, and process mapping is probably the simplest and the most effective tool. Uh, and if you, if you want to gain the most value, I would say just get started with the process map. Uh, it's, it's a simple description of the process steps 
in, in, and it is presented in such a way that everybody in the facility can get a shared and clear understanding of the process. And this helps the team communicate much better and it, it can go a long way with respect to safety. And uh, as part of this talk, there are uh, uh, these four videos that I'll present, uh, depending on the time, we may or may not be able to get to all of them. Uh, but the, all these videos are available to through the AAPM uh, Quality and Safety page, TG100 Implementation Guide. And give me a second as I to the link. Are you all able to Today see? we will talk about process. Are you all able to see the video and hear it? Okay, perfect. Yes, In yes, order to understand a process map and the purpose of building one, we must first ask the question, what is a process? A process is a series of steps or actions, a set of logically related tasks performed to achieve a specific goal. What then is a process map? A process map can be a number of things. It can simply be a simple, a picture of the steps of a process arranged in order, a display of the flow of information, or a diagram displaying the interrelationships between steps. Let's consider the simple example of walking a dog. First, you grab a leash. Second, you attach the leash to the dog's collar. And third, you leave the house. The process map is created by simply taking the steps of this process and turning them into a visual display with a logical order. A process and each step within it can have inputs and outputs. Let's consider another process map. This one is created to describe the procedures for external beam radiation therapy, with the endpoint being the completion of radiotherapy treatment. The main trunk of this tree is considered the process. We can have sub-processes that branch off from the main process. The sub-processes that occur as one prepares for a patient's treatment are consult, CT simulation, planning, plan checks, imaging or IGRT, and finally treatment. Each sub-process can have steps that go into it. For example, during consultation, the patient may complete a medical history. Then the history and a physical exam or HMP are completed and documented. This particular process map shows how these major steps are related in a temporal order as they go from left to right. A process map can take on many other forms, anything that facilitates the understanding of a process. This next example of a process map is from Ford et al. It was also built to describe the external beam treatment process. The authors use the process map to understand the flow of information as a patient moves through the department and the handoffs that can occur between different groups. Here are a couple of more examples. The first is used in the AAPM Incident Learning System consensus document. This process map highlights the major steps in the external beam process. The next is describing the same workflow, but from the World Health Organization's radiotherapy risk profile. This one is as published in Astro's Safety is No Accident. Finally, this process tree is from TG100, describing the steps involved to treat a patient with IMRT. Note the difference between this tree and the previous maps. Now that we have considered a couple of examples of process maps, we can ask the question, what is the purpose of a process map? And how does it relate to my safety and quality goals? The first purpose is that it provides a common understanding of a clinical process. You may find that people in your department are performing the same task but are doing so in a different way. And that can be very useful when considering the risk of each task. The second purpose is that it is a starting point for failure modes and effects analysis. For example, in using a process map for FMEA, let's consider this map, which describes the steps involved to image and treat a patient using a deep inspiration breath hold technique. The best way to collect failure modes is to think through each step in a process and consider the various ways that step could go wrong. In one of these steps, we acquire a free breathing CT and two breath hold CTs. A possible failure mode for this step is that the scans could be labeled incorrectly, or in the step where physics fuses the scans together, the fusion may be done incorrectly. The process map is crucial in walking through various ways in which a process can fail. How do I create my own process map? A number of tools are available, with the easiest being a paper and pen. One could also use commercial products. 
Products that allow for the use of flowchart symbols and connectors are the most useful. A word of caution. Do not get too caught up in fancy graphics. The overall goal is to have a process map that is clear and easily understood in order to move on to the next step in the risk analysis. A few tips to get started. Form a team. The team should have members from multiple disciplines and be cross-functional. The team could consist of radiation oncologist, medical physicist, dosimetrist, therapist, nurses, IT personnel, or administrators. Various team members from the department will bring a different perspective to the process. A facilitator familiar with risk analysis tools and process mapping is helpful, but not necessary. Right, so now that we got a, a brief introduction to process mapping, so here is an oversimplified uh, process map of a patient undergoing radiation therapy. And uh, uh, as you can see, it has uh, inputs and outputs, it has a start and an end. So a process map is something that can um, to show you where you are currently in the process as you describe it to somebody, and also tells you where you, will, uh, where you would like to go. And a process map can be used to describe an existing process in the clinic as part, as part of your discussion, or it could be used to design a new process you know, which you would like to implement. Uh, so, and a process map can get really complicated and let, uh, let that not stop you from, from trying it out. It is so useful when you start using it. Uh, and uh, the, the key over here is choose a level of uh, complexity that would help you uh, make this tool useful. Don't start with something that is so complex where you record every single mouse click of a software to do a process map. The, 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 it'll get so cumbersome that people will lose interest in it. And don't use something that is so generic that doesn't capture the nuances of the process itself. So the right level of complexity would, be, uh, would help using this tool well. So uh, process maps um, can be used for a common understanding of the clinical process. They serve as a taxonomy for the incident learning system that you would probably use. Uh, and it's a starting point for FMEA, which we will be seeing shortly. And it can be used for efficiency and value stream, uh, value stream studies. This may not have, this uh, value stream study may not necessarily be of interest to you. However, an administrator in the department may find, find this really useful. And I can't emphasize enough the, the first point here a common understanding. As you go through this exercise in your clinic, what you will realize is people saying, oh, I didn't know that's how you did it. Or I didn't know that's the step that you did before I carried on with the process. And it makes me understand like uh, what you do and make uh, value somebody else's input. So uh, uh, this uh, is a very good tool for team building. Now let's switch gears and we will look at uh, failure modes and effects analysis and shortly uh, and in short called FMEA. So what is FMEA? So now we have established a process, we've defined it, we've been able to um, put it into a pictorial form. So now you, uh, the FMEA provides you a way to assess risk uh, and it identifies weaknesses and deficiencies and it also helps you prioritize risks so that you can look at the riskiest part of your process and focus uh, attention on it. And uh, it is a step-by-step -step approach uh, to, to do this. Uh, and it is widely used in industry and it's ga gaining a broader adoption in healthcare. It's a simple uh, structured way to assess potential failure modes. And here is a short video on uh, FMEA. In this video, we are going to talk about FMEA, Failure Modes and Effects Analysis. What is FMEA? It is a risk assessment tool. It is used to identify weaknesses or deficiencies in processes. It is a step-by-step -step approach for assessing postulated failure modes in a clinical process. What are failure modes anyway? They are simply the ways that something can go wrong. A failure mode happens when a process step does not produce the desired outcome. What is the purpose of FMEA? We want to identify any weaknesses in a process. In order to do that, we identify failure modes in a process, 
and ask a number of questions about how these failure modes came to be and how they might affect the patient. Because all failure modes are not created equally, we also want to assess the risk associated with each type of failure. FMEA allows us to do just that. How do I conduct this analysis in my clinic? Start with a process map. Carefully consider each step in the process and try to think of failure modes or ways that something could go wrong with each step. Then comes the job of scoring the failure modes. Let's discuss more details of FMEA via an example. Consider this simple process for radiation therapy planning, starting with CT simulation and ending with the export of the plan and images to the RMB system. The process step that we will conduct an FMEA for is the importing of images into the planning system database. We take this process step and start to build a table. In the table, consider including the following information. First, we'll make a column for the potential failure modes. Next, it is useful to think of the potential causes of each failure. You'll ask the question, why did this failure mode ultimately occur? In addition, you'll want to make note of the potential effects of failure modes. This will be helpful when you start scoring failure modes. Now you will want to record failure modes. Ask yourself the question, how can this step go wrong? In this example, when importing images, we could import the wrong patient's images, import the wrong imaging study, like the wrong phase of a 4D or a wrong MR sequence, or perhaps we could import corrupt data. So those are three failure modes we have thought of for this step. Now let's record the potential causes of each failure. We can look briefly at a list of causes, which include types of human errors, like distraction or lack of attention, software and hardware errors, miscommunication, or inadequate training or skill. These are just a few to get you thinking. For our fairy modes, the wrong patient's images being imported could simply be due to the manual selection of the incorrect patient. The wrong imaging study being imported could be due to a couple of things, inadequate training of appropriate imaging studies to acquire or import, or miscommunication among the team about which study is appropriate. And corrupt data could ultimately be the result of a software error. Let's now go through the potential effect of each failure. Ask yourself the question, how would this failure affect the patient? If we import the wrong patient images, we could end up with the wrong dose distribution or the wrong target volume. If we import the wrong imaging study, we could again end up with the wrong dose distribution or the wrong target volume. Let's split the next failure mode up into having two effects. One effect could be the loss of patient images, or the other, more severe type of data corruption could also result in the wrong dose distribution or the wrong target volume. Now we will score each failure mode, taking into account the information we have just recorded. If we are going to come up with a score, we need a scoring system. This table is from TG100, and it describes three parameters which we will use to characterize and prioritize each failure. Please note that this scale is from 1 to 10, though other scales have been used. The first parameter, occurrence, or O, describes the likelihood that a particular cause for the specified failure mode exists. O ranges from 1, failure unlikely, to 10, failure likelihood is substantial. Severity, or S, describes the severity of the effect on the final outcome if the failure is not detected or corrected. In other words, how severe is the effect on the patient if this failure were to reach the patient? S ranges from 1, no danger or minimal clinical disturbance, to 10, with a catastrophic outcome. Detectability, or D, describes the likelihood that the failure would not be detected in time to prevent an error. D ranges from 1, very detectable, to 10, very hard to detect. Use your knowledge and experience with this process to determine these values. You'll note in this example that different potential causes may occur at different frequencies and are therefore scored separately, whereas different causes with the same effect on the patient will end up with the same severity score. These three parameters are multiplied together to obtain a single metric called a risk priority number, RPN. These tables are often sorted by RPN and severity rankings to recognize both the most hazardous and the most severe failure pathways. A few tips to get started. Form a team. Make it multidisciplinary and cross-functional 
with representatives from various groups in your department. And so the purpose of FMEA is to provide insight into the risk process so that interventions can be applied. And uh, not only do they provide insight, but they also help you prioritize, which is a difficulty because what could happen is you could just be, uh, after doing a process, you could just be overwhelmed with the sheer number of things that need to be fixed. But how do you know which one to address first? So your RPN score, uh, risk priority number, well, if you read it backwards, like the number that prioritizes risk, uh, is what will help you uh, determine which one to address first. Uh, here, uh, uh, many team members actually struggle with the the, the uh, qualitative uh, like nature of scoring, and you would see that people would say, "Oh, you know, I think this is more like a five. This, you know, this occurrence is a four, or four, or the severity, you know." And and people uh, try to uh, find it difficult to come up with a number. Actually, it doesn't matter what the number is, as long as you're internally consistent and everybody sort of agrees on it. Uh, uh, what uh, I wouldn't suggest is like try to make averages of numbers because we, we would like to be more accurate. It's just better to pick one and, and go with it. Um, and uh, uh, what it provides, it's not the numbers itself or the, the risk score that is important, but it's the structured approach that FMEA provides that uh, will be helpful in this uh, uh, prioritizing of risks. So uh, let's look at a simple FMEA over here. So here's a process where you uh, go uh, get up in the morning and go to work and you have to treat an HDR that day. Um, so the so we start with a process map uh, and the steps, uh, sub steps are uh, you get up, you take a shower, uh, get dressed, have breakfast, uh, and then uh, you drive to work and you have a morning huddle and then you have the rest of the day. Uh, and if you look at the images closely, you'll realize actually the driving to work step is probably the riskiest of them all. Uh, when you're trying to eat a donut, having a coffee, holding a steering wheel, and trying to uh, be on a conversation with somebody on the phone uh, in, in Boston traffic, uh, I would not recommend it. So let's uh, look at uh, a pro uh, uh, an FMEA analysis. So let's look at the sub step of uh, driving to work. So what are... Um, the poss uh, possible things that uh, the po possible failure modes, you either did not drive to work or you did not arrive in time. And here, uh, the thing to note uh, over here uh, is to make sure that you define your uh, potential failure modes in the negative, such as did not drive or did not arrive on time. And this will help you clearly define what your potential failure mode is, and it'll also promote clear thinking. Uh, if uh, you do this exercise in your clinic and you realize, oh, you know, I can't quite come up with effects or, or causes quite well, it may be because that the potential failure mode was not defined quite uh, clearly. So now, uh, now that we've defined the potential failure modes, so what are the effects? The effects are that the uh, if you didn't uh, reach work, uh, then the patient did not get an HDR treatment which is quite uh, severe. And if uh, you were uh, delayed uh, and you arrived, did not arrive on time, the HDR treatment was uh, delayed by an hour. Uh, and this um, uh, potential effect is what you wanna look at when you wanna get a score for severity. And now that we have the effects, uh, there could be multiple causes that, that lead uh, to a certain effect. So in this case, you know, we've, uh, for, in this example, we've taken erroneous work calendar that didn't, um, uh, you know, thought that you were off on a day that you weren't, uh, or you were sick, uh, things that are beyond your control. And then uh, for arriving late is again, uh, erroneous shift calendar where uh, you didn't, uh, the shift was marked incorrectly or uh, car troubles. Uh, and the way uh, you would use this to score is you would use the effect, uh, sort of think about the effect to come up with a score for severity uh, and cause uh, uh, the potential uh, cause of failure will help you think about the occurrence and how many times it happens. And the PFM, the potential failure mode, will help you uh, think about the detectability risk. So in this example, they've come up with a, a set of numbers. The numbers themselves are not uh, important. So what you do is you, you um, uh, multiply OS and Ds to get an RPN value, and then you uh, 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 um, prioritize them in descending order, and you address the one with the highest RPN and the highest severity score. Uh, and as you can see uh, in this example, uh, 
the, the uh, issue with the calendar is actually affecting treatment, which is beyond the, the radiation treatment itself. So this clinic needs to look at and figure out like what's going on with their with department's calendar and why things are being scheduled incorrectly. So uh, now let's uh, take a closer look at the next uh, piece of the puzzle, the fall tree analysis. So now that we have created a process, we have prioritized our risks. So the FTA will uh, help you understand the failure, uh, the propagation in the process and how that happens. It identifies uh, systemic uh, program risks and it'll help you decide when and where to place barriers such as QAs and QCs um, into the process. Here is a simple video on FTA. In this video, we will talk about FTA, or fault tree analysis. What is a fault tree? It is a tool used to trace failure pathways back to the causes and contributing factors. A fault tree analysis starts with the FMEA. Imagine that we have identified a failure mode and its potential cause but it is likely that there are many steps in between these two. With fault tree analysis, we are taking a closer look at the failure pathway. In the analysis, we ask the question, how could this failure mode propagate into an error? What happens in between the underlying cause and the failure? It is possible that some pathways are stronger or weaker than others at catching and preventing failures. Thus, we are able to identify systemic program weaknesses, if present. It is also likely that we have quality checks along the way, and we have the opportunity to realize whether they are effective. That is, do we have the quality checks in the most effective spot in the process to catch or prevent an error? How do I build my own fault tree? Start with the FMEA. Identify a failure mode in need of a quality management plan. Let's take the failure of importing the wrong imaging study, such as the wrong 4D phase or the wrong MR sequence, and place it on the left side of the fault tree. What could have led to the wrong study being imported? It could be that the wrong images were acquired in the first place, or it could be that the correct images were acquired, but the wrong images were exported. We have the option in a fault tree to choose from an OR gate or an AND gate. When two or more separate events can lead to a failure, we use an OR gate, meaning either pathway would lead to this failure. When two or more events must occur for the failure to propagate, we use an AND gate. In this example, either circumstance could lead to this failure, so we use an OR gate. Now, each of these causes we have identified are also failure modes themselves, with causes of their own, so we keep going and building the fault tree, adding more causes. At this point, we ask, what could have caused the wrong images to be acquired? It could be that the technologist did not have the knowledge of the appropriate imaging studies to acquire due to lack of standard operating procedures, or perhaps there is some standard in the department, but there was inadequate training. Both of these could independently lead to this failure, so we use an OR gate. Next, what could have caused the correct images to be acquired, but the wrong images are imported? In this case, miscommunication between team members could have occurred, or perhaps lack of attention on the part of a team member. Either of these could lead to the failure. At this point, we can keep adding causes until the causes are out of our control. Let's look at another. Now that we have a brief understanding of uh, what an FTA does, um, let's look at it. So uh, yeah, as mentioned in the video, there are many ways in which a cause can uh, result in a potential failure mode. And uh, F, uh, to give some context for FTA in terms of FMEA is that it connects the dots between the potential causes and, and the propagation uh, such that it uh, results in a failure. So uh, here is a blank um, uh, FTA diagram. It's a generic uh, uh, fault tree, and in which uh, you, what you do is you put your potential failure mode on the very left, and you work backwards to find what are the contributory causes that lead to this uh, error. And um, the uh, the way that uh, you, I, I suggest that you do this in the clinic is uh, you assign somebody to be a, a three year old, 
and you say, you know, this is the error. And all they have to say is keep, uh, they have to just keep asking why. And then somebody says, oh, this is why this happened. And then they say, why? And then you keep going to a point where things are beyond your control. And at that point, that's that's the last cause you, you, you want to stop at. Because anything that's beyond your control uh, that will, will not be under a radiation therapy process will not, uh, will not be useful to you. Um, and, and you want to uh, come up with causes that are reasonable and realistic. So you can always, uh, you know, uh, sort of extrapolate to find something that is completely out of uh, the ordinary. So keep this uh, example real and, and uh, make sure that somebody is a three-year-old in your group and you'll be quite successful in doing this. And it's important uh, to look at the, the uh, gates that you would use. Uh, so, uh, which you will see in the next slide. So we start with uh, a postulated failure, uh, which means the error hasn't occurred, but you're thinking in this process, that this, this could possibly happen uh, to get an FDA started. And then as you work backwards to find the contributory causes, make sure you explicitly use and or or gates, because that will determine how weak or, or strong a specific process is, and which we will see in the next slide. So here is an, um, an illustrative uh, hypothetical error uh, in, in dose calculation. And as you can see, uh, to calculate dose, you need parameters that are uh, wide in range and you, you use those to calculate dose. And here in the, in the very first layer, you have all these QC steps to ensure that the data that comes out is uh, accurate. And then you have a QA step after the dose is calculated to make sure that the error in calculation doesn't pass through. So the, if, when you convert OR gates to AND gates, you make your process safer. And now uh, let's tie this all together. Uh, we've gained a lot of insight by using these uh, tools. We've uh, used a process map to, to, to make sure everybody understands the process clearly. We have ranked our risks using FMEA. And we, with the FTA, we have figured out how it actually happens. And then uh, the next step would be how would we implement QA and QC steps so that you have an effective quality management program. So what is um, a quality management program? Uh, it is, uh, so to uh, quote, uh, safety is no accident. It's an overall program that aims to organize all the efforts uh, appro uh, appropriately such that it promotes quality, safety, and consistency. And uh, you implement interventions to improve safety and quality using this risk analysis. And uh, here, the, the third one is key, where you monitor the effectiveness of interventions. You should always think about a quality management program as uh, something that you, it's, that you do on an ongoing basis with a feedback loop. Uh, what happens is that you would, uh, somebody would come up with a QC methodology, which would be perfect for the process, and you do that. But uh, over the, oh, uh, as time passes on, uh, the process itself changes, you have software upgrades, things change, but you still hold on to the old uh, QC process. Now what, what you're doing is you've just added more work to yourself, which is actually draining resources from, from doing effective quality ma uh, management. So when you do a feedback loop and you what you ensure is to make sure that, that the QC is still effective and it needs to do what it needs to do and in the step that it has to be at. So here is our short video on quality management. The final video in this series is intended to give some guidance on a quality management program. By now, we have reviewed some risk assessment tools. After learning from my process map, analyzing and ranking potential failures in their pathways, the most impactful work comes next. How am I going to build a safer system? How am I going to manage weaknesses that were identified? What tools do I use to prevent failures? Before panic sets in, for quality assurance and quality control activities, there are a few guidelines available. TG100 references the Institute for Safe Medical Practices, ISMP list of quality management tools. This list is sorted by effectiveness so that the lower numbers indicate more effective quality management tools. Consider the most effective or forcing functions, creating interlocks or barriers to literally force the user to follow another pathway, such that the potential cause is removed. The next is introducing automation into a process, as any kind of manual entry is error-prone. This can be achieved through barcodes, automated monitoring, 
computerized verification, and computerized order entry. Next on the list is protocols, standards, and information. It is considered to be of intermediate effectiveness to institute checkoff forms, clear protocols, alarms, labels, signs, and to reduce similarity. Moving down the list is independent double-check systems and other redundancies, such as redundant measurements, independent reviews, operational checks, comparison with standards, increased monitoring, status checks, or acceptance test. Next is rules and policies that establish priority, communication lines, staffing levels, scheduling, mandatory pauses, repair, PMIs, and other QC and QA work. And lastly, there is the option of providing education and information to staff. The U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs National Center for Patient Safety also has a list of safety interventions that are ranked as stronger actions, intermediate actions, and weaker actions. Some of the interventions are the same as in the previous list and are ranked similarly. Both lists are great resources in thinking of which quality activities are best suited to your potential failure pathway. Let's review an example. At the uh, interest of time, I stopped that video, but, but however, all these videos are available on the APM uh, quality and uh, safety page uh, on the TG100 implementation guide, so it should be accessible to everybody. Um, so uh, now that, that we understand uh, what a quality management is and what are uh, the various methodologies that you can address these risks, um, uh, I'm sure everybody is quite familiar with the hard stops and timeouts, and timeouts are, are really effective. Uh, it gives you a pause in the process right before you do something really intense, like some, say, even, uh, something like an SRS, SBRT, uh, you know, things that are where you're going to deliver such high dose in, in such a short time, you want to make sure everything is right. And uh, for the team to take a pause, there's nothing more effective than, uh, than a timeout. Um, and then a checklist, uh, I feel, are probably the most underutilized of uh, the safety um, um, features that are available to us. Uh, safety checklists uh, need to be effective. You, don't, you, you shouldn't have a, a checklist that is way too long, that, that is laborious, and people just get desensitized and just keep check bar, like, you know, checking the boxes without really thinking about it. Uh, so what you have to do is capture the exact things that you know, typically get missed, and, and you, can, you can find that out by just asking people, hey, well, you know, what, what do you think comes back to you? What, what, what do people ask you to fix in the process again and again. And those are the things that you want to add in the checklist. And that may change over time because you may add it to a checklist and get really good at it. And then they, you may slip on something else. So you want to have a checklist of list of things that actually are effective, not just a long list of things to check, which are not effective at all. Uh, and if your department uh, has not implemented a formalized um, uh, no-fly zone or sterile cockpit, it, it would be prudent to do so especially in uh, a safety critical area, such as the council area for treatment. Um, and as mentioned before, uh, the safety culture is probably the most important of them all. Uh, and it is an overarching culture in, in the department for placing the safety of the patient and the staff in the forefront. No excuses. And that's all I have for the uh, tools itself. And uh, the, uh, this is uh, a brief, uh, uh, the resources that are available. Uh, well, here is our TG100 group. We have uh, nearly uh, doubled in size um, uh, since uh, last year. We, we were a small uh, group and now they have a lot of uh, interested people who have joined us. Uh, and uh, and uh, so we uh, work on implementation of TG100 methodologies and the subgroups, there are subgroups that focus on different tasks. Uh, our recent areas of focus have been training workshop and related materials. Uh, brief video tutorials and tip sheets. Uh, and uh, we also have an online repository, which can be found in this mpec.aapm.org. Uh, this um, uh, website has crowdsourced tools. So if you, uh, you don't need to go buy some commercial tools, right? Well, we have uh, tools for performing um, uh, an FMEA and FTA. Uh, and also I think there's a draw.io, uh, which helps you do a process map. Um, so we have um, all of that in this link. Uh, however, I think that we are uh, uh, planning to find a home for this such that it can be accessible to the community in a, in a better format.
Um, then uh, with respect to community uh, uh, adoption, there've been uh, a, a half a dozen or so um, uh, national guidelines documents that have used uh, or incorporated the uh, or referenced the TG100 methodology. Uh, and in the last five years, there's been over 28 uh, uh, peer-reviewed uh, full uh, papers published uh, that have either referenced the methodologies of TG100 uh, and they've been used for various radiation oncology modalities and processes. And uh, so these are our uh, list of resources. And if you have, if you uh, try this in your uh, clinic and you've run into issues, we would love to hear from you. Uh, you can email us in our alias. Uh, Courtney Bucky is our chair, uh, and I'm uh, reachable on the same email as well. And here are the other um, uh, quality and safety pages, the repository link and the link to the paper itself. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Navneet. And um, uh, all the videos that Navneet has shared uh, or showed us today are available um, to non WAPM members. Arjit has checked himself and uh, a few others have commented too. Uh, we have a few questions. Um, I want to start with the question that Dr. Van Dyke has asked last, which is can you give examples of hard stops and timeouts for medical physics activities. You mentioned the SRS and SBRT timeout, but I'm guessing uh, he's asking if there are others. So uh, hard stops uh, are uh, if uh, the, the best possible hard stops uh, uh, as uh, described by the, the Institute of Safe Medical Practice are, are hardware and software interlocks. Uh, so for, for the example in which uh, the, the SRS cone uh, that uh, if the uh, the machine was old such that it didn't have an interlock that would prevent a treatment if the field size was more than 50 millimeters by 50 millimeters where the jaw would have to close behind the cone. Uh, so something like that are, are hard stops. Uh, other than that, what, what, what uh, you can do is uh, uh, right now there's a lot of automation and scripting coming along. You can, uh, you can uh, build those into the checklist such that they check uh, thing. So we um, uh, something uh, with respect to IMRT plans we, we were realizing was sometimes the dose fractionation would uh, uh, change. And so your uh, uh, leaf motion calculator would not have calculate, uh, calculated the, the, the most optimized fluence pattern for it. Uh, and so, but it, the Eclipse system, however, will let you um, uh, to treat the plan. And if it's within two or three percent, the MLC leaves will still be able to keep up with it. Uh, so what we did was we uh, came up with uh, a script that would check to make sure that the LMC calculation was done after any changes to the ch uh, the prescription fractionation itself. So that way the MLC, is, so uh, um, that would be one of the hard stuff. So the, the, this script would be run at the end of it or it would be run as part of the physics check and you would find out that, okay, this, you know, th th this has to be sent back or it has to be recalculated. Um, and um, those are the ones that come to the top of my mind right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, now I'll start on top. Um, so someone asked, where can they find data about incidents on national level for research purposes? I believe, um, yeah, you can find, uh, so there's, um, so it, it depends on how you define data as. So there are incident learning systems uh, that are supported by, uh, as patient safety organizations that produce reports on a regular basis. However, uh, uh, there is a distinction between uh, uh, prospective risk analysis and retrospective risk analysis. So what do you get from these incident learning systems uh, and their data uh, uh, publications is that what happened in one clinic and what was the solution, which, uh, which is really useful uh, to look at and, and sort of gain an understanding on. However, they may not, uh, again, directly be applicable to your uh, uh, clinic. So uh, as good as the data may be, uh, sometimes uh, uh, in this case, for, for prospective risk analysis, you may have to do it yourself uh, to find out what the risks are in your clinic and use that data effectively. Okay, um, I think that the, the, the that, that's why they said for research purposes because it's not just clinical, right? So they were looking, I guess, for uh, big data. Um, 
Anoop Jassal said, thanks for this informative and useful presentation, Navneet. My question is what device you can offer to implement this methodology when assessing automation uh, that we may be considering to adopt uh, between parentheses, AI and other automatic features? Uh, there are, uh, uh, I, I think like now that um, uh, at least I, I am quite familiar with uh, uh, the variant implementation, I um, I have used Mosaic as well, but I do know that uh, uh, variant has opened up its uh, database to be, uh, to allow scripting. And uh, so uh, there are a lot of people who are working on this and, and coming up with uh, like in-house scripts. Uh, and you know uh, the problem is that you know they develop it for themselves, and 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 uh, anything that is not uh, uh, commercially published, you know, has its own risks when you try to implement somebody else's script. There are commercially available programs as well. Um, uh, 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 Radformations is uh, one of them, and I do believe that uh, uh, Varian is uh, also has some scripts as part of their. Um, uh, I forget it is their uh, medical affairs page, which is uh, and so they do have uh, like uh, uh, certain things that are available that they publish, um, and uh, they used to be a peer review at, um, group. I think uh, supported again uh, by uh, Varian that um, used to house uh, some scripts, uh, but I think. Uh, it, all this is just beginning, and I'm pretty sure there are uh, there's going to be a, an explosion of, of of such solutions in the near future. Considering there's only like one um, main uh, company out there that produces commercial commercially available uh, scripts. Um, uh, Thank you, Jake Van Dark says IAEA has the Safran database with voluntary reporting on errors. So that's for everyone. Yeah. Um, Anoop has another question. What special concerns or techniques can you recommend for applying these methodologies on process where the human elements are being reduced? For example, AI. Oh, I see. So, so, um, so what you're saying is uh, the, the risk due to human error is high. So now we are replacing it with automation. Uh, but then the, that uh, by itself uh, adds a, a level of uh, risk uh, itself, which which is uh, absolutely true. Uh, so, um, and this goes back to the uh, the basis of uh, prospective uh, risk analysis. It tells you so what you need to do as in in the clinic is understand how the clinical process works. Just because there's a black box that does one portion of it, uh, doesn't mean that it will work fine. Uh, in, in every scenario. So what, 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 when you implement any sort of black box or automation system, you need to test it to the limits. You need to test it in, in circumstances that are beyond and find what its limits are and, and clearly define those. Then you say, these uh, um, uh, scripts or whatnot will work well within these parameters. But then, you know, if, if uh, in such and such scenario, this script may not work well. So it is our job to make sure that those limits are defined. And then what you do is you find solutions so that it can account for these uh, circumstances that are beyond. And so you increase the scope. Uh, but it is our uh, job to define the boundaries within which they work well. And in general, it is our job also to keep an eye on artificial intelligence, right? And yes. make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Maura Mon, uh, Monville says, how can I receive the attendance certificate? That's for us. Where can I download the slides uh, from? So the certificates will be sent to you in a few weeks. And the slides will be posted, or the presentation will be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, so that's for everyone to review. I think. Uh, I, I think question. that's it. Oh, okay, can, please. Yeah, I can ask, Namit, uh, what would be a good process uh, to pick and start, like in your clinic, if you, you know, someone over here attending is interested? So I, I would say um, uh, it's it's uh, it's easy. Usually, it, it comes to you. Uh, uh, people would be asking questions like, "Oh, you know, this this keeps bothering me, or this keeps happening in in uh, again and again. Like, uh, how can we how can we fix it?" And usually it ends up in your lab. So it's, these are the things that you want to pick up. And the reason for that is, uh, for one, there's already interest on uh, uh, in the group 
to fix an issue because it's it's bothersome. Uh, and then uh, secondly, when you uh, when you take something uh, and always pick something that is simple. Don't uh, don't you know dive into something that is extremely complex because what will happen is you lose interest halfway or the team will lose interest halfway and just because of of the clinical nature of our work and you know something else will come in the way. So pick something small and pick something that's actionable. Uh, something that's bothering somebody in the group. And if you can, you know, process map that, figure out where the error is and uh, figure out what are the checks that you can do such that this error doesn't keep happening, you, you'd, uh, it'll go a long way. So that would be the first thing I would start with. Yeah, that's a good way to get the team to buy in. One of the considerations, I mean, for implementing all these uh, systems is to have a motivation from the leadership and if the leadership is uh, prone to open themselves to criticism or to reviewing and to hear from everybody else that it's involved in the process that's a very important role and that's why um, as physicists i mean we are the ones that probably know the best about managing this process, but I mean, we need to have the buy-in from both you know, the leadership in the department or the institution and from the leaders of the subgroups, like the chief of technologists or the, you know, the administrators and so on. And, and I think this is why it's, this is a, it's not just a technical issue, it's a cultural issue also. It is, it definitely is. Uh, and I think it, uh, as physicists, we have to try to push whenever we can. Uh, uh, some, most people have some sort of an incident learning system, either an in-house or, or something like Royals or uh, Saffron or, and whatnot. And uh, during your quarterly meetings, when you have quality and safety meetings, when you discuss these issues and people say, oh, you know, why does this happen? Like, you know, what, how do we look into it? Uh, that would be a good time to present saying that here are some options to look at prospective risk analysis. So, uh, and it, it has to be a nudge, it you know, we, it may not be full blown, uh, but you know, uh, that's why e starting with just process mapping would, would really help. You know, you, you don't have to go all the way. Don't, don't think that, oh, uh, you can do these in bits and pieces. And once the team sees value in it, the, the, it's more likely that they would, they would try to go on to the next step. One, one of the most important points that both in the APM presentation and you made the mention of that is that you have to involve all the players because many times I mean we as physicists think that people do certain things certain way and, and vice versa and and I think that having that process as a group um, participation I mean can can point to many things that I mean we are and hidden then, and that they they, they are yeah. causes of yeah, the team build misinformation. Yes, and the team building aspect of it is amazing. Anytime you do an exercise, people are like, "Wow, I didn't know that's what you did." And you you've worked with them for ten years, and and they it so it, uh, like we do work in silos, and and this sort of brings the team together. And you do want everybody in the team. Uh, you you do, don't try to do a, a process map for your uh, you know monthly QA and say, "Yeah, I I did a TG one hundred. I I don't think it's you, you, it'll go a long way. You got to look at the whole clinical process and see where it'll be most effective." Yeah, with the interest of time, uh, thank you so much, Namli, for giving us your time. And thank you to everyone from all over the world to attend the webinar. We appreciate it. And uh, as Sarah mentioned, uh, you will be receiving, uh, I guess, some multiple choice questions or something uh, that you have to answer in order to receive uh, an attendance certificate. Uh, and we will send that to you. Uh, Sarah also posted our YouTube page that will have the recording uh, on there shortly. And uh, yeah, until next time. And thank you uh, to the MPW and the board members and everybody who hosted it and, and Ajit and Sarah for uh, moderating this talk. Uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.